Welcome to a special extra Apple Insider episode. I'm William Gallagher, and if you've already heard yesterday's regular edition, you'll know that Wes Hilliard and I have been trying to find a developer to give just the right perspective on WWDC, and you'll know that we found exactly the right one to ask as well. It's Alexander Kosovan, and he's the founder of MacPoor, which uh, which has been an Apple Insider sponsor before. And MacPoor, it's done uh, Clean My Mac, it's uh, set up, it's done Clean My iPhone, all three things I use myself, and that would be enough. That's three major apps this man is responsible for. And MacPoor has been developing Apple apps since around 2008. Uh, yeah. He was at Apple Park this week. Yeah. These are all the. Re- what more reason could you possibly have to talk to him? But there is one. Because remember, Setup. Setup is one subscription service that gets you full use of more than 200 Mac apps. So, Alexander has to know about, well, he has to think about what the opportunities, what the challenges are that Apple's new APIs, new system, new features are offering him as a developer, but also 200 other developers. So, Alexander, just perfect. Thank you very much for coming on to the Apple Insider podcast. Hi, William. It is a great honor to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I'd love to share all of the updates. Brilliant. There's so much to ask you, but I've got to start with just a set the scene for us, actually, because you were at Apple Park. The rest of us were all watching the keynote at home. I presume they showed you the video in the Steve Jobs Theater. Is that what it was like? Uh, yeah, it actually was my first time at Apple Park, and before that I was in other uh, WWDCs, uh, like 10, 10 times before maybe, uh, but this is the first time in Apple Park, so it was really exciting to be there for, for the first time. Yeah, so uh, at, at first uh, they, they met every developer at their own Infinity Loop campus. Um, there was a registration and a small party uh, for all of the uh, developers and, and press, uh, uh, so it was uh, like one experience and the next day there was like this big event in the Apple Park and they also allowed visitors uh, inside their territory, uh, inside the, the loop, <laughs> uh, where there was this park, uh, this pond, uh, uh, like a very nice area. So I was really impressed. I have this image uh, that you walk around Apple Park and there's um, uh, Tim Cook and Craig Federici jogging around the whole loop all the time. Well, I haven't seen Tim Tim Cook there, but uh, I've seen uh, Sam Altman, uh, which is a big star (laughs) as well. Yes. (laughs) He might come up again as a topic. Um, Before we get to the actual thing of the details of what you've seen, um, you got to see the same keynote that we did, but I think we forget the WWDC is a week long extravaganza, really, with at least dozens, if not a hundred or more sessions that are really, really specific. In that time, I presume Apple gave out far more detail than he could ever have crammed into the keynote. How do you approach that as a developer? How do you decide which sessions to go to and how does it all work for you? Uh, yeah, so frankly, it was not the whole week. It was uh, only uh, three days, uh, but only the first day was uh, the keynote and the State of the Union uh, presentation. And afterwards, uh, there were a limited number of uh, uh, labs and one-to-one one sessions with Apple developers and engineers. Uh, so it was very limited in time, c- comparing to the previous WDCs that were uh, like before covid and and that- the reason the Apple guys explained us is that right now they have an opportunity to uh, reach so many new potential developers, like uh, tens of thousands of them, uh, versus uh, when they uh, visit uh, and do directly the uh, WWDC event and have uh, much longer sessions. Uh, so and they prefer this format because uh, it's uh, pre-edited, uh, it's like filtered content that you already receive uh, like very beautiful <laughs> wrapping <laughs> and all of the uh, online uh, videos that you can watch online and they prefer this format because for them it's uh, much more I would say uh, concentrated uh, to, right. to present to developers okay um, I knew about the uh, online access to those because I've watched a few of them over the last couple of years um, 
does that mean so for you 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 had a certain you saw the keynote you had a certain amount of one-to-one contacts you've now got all of this material that you and your team can work through how much contact will you have with apple between now and sort of the release of all this software uh, so there was an uh, opportunity immediately after the State of the Union uh, where you can meet in the Apple engineers and there were so many different uh, labs and sessions that you could go to uh, but uh, definitely there was not in, in enough time to speak with all of them. Uh, all you, can, you could do is like in a few words describe the new technology and how you might use it and exchange uh, contacts uh, to reach them later uh, uh, when you need them. I mean, I imagine they're obviously open to being contacted because they want to help. They want you to do your thing. But they've also, they must have been under a lot of time pressure. Do you find uh, it's easy to get the information you need from Apple after this sort of thing? Uh, well, we'll see, uh, because I definitely was not able to uh, get all of the information uh, during the, the labs, because even the Apple engineers uh, were quite frustrated, because they still were not aware which information they can already share, <laughs> which is st- still under NDA, so they had to check uh, with, uh, with their managers or policies, I don't know, uh, so they were not willing to share all of the information, So, but we'll see later. Um, is that unusual for this year, or is that just typical, do you think, of WWDC? Uh, well, I think it's uh, a bit unusual, uh, first of all, because uh, the format was different. It's the first time they have this, I think the first time, yeah, and they have this uh, format where uh, they returned to one-on-one uh, labs uh, with developers after the COVID. Uh, mm. So uh, I think the... Apple engineers were still like learning what what do how they can provide maximum value from this new uh, format. So it feels you've had a certain amount of information, but um, maybe not as much as in most years for it. Uh, are there is there anything so far that's come to you that's leapt out as being particularly useful for for you at MacPore as a developer? Uh, yeah, so uh, besides the uh, labs, there was an opportunity to go to uh, additional sessions that Apple had uh, in the development center. Uh, for You could uh, sign up for this event uh, prior to WWDC. They, they had a limited number of seats there, uh, but they would explain uh, in additional details all of the new technologies, uh, what, what they added. It was something like the extended stand of the union uh, session right okay interesting it feels like you've got to think very quickly to decide what to ask them in the limited time that you have (laughs) Is that right? Yeah, so personally for me, I noted all of the interesting new technologies uh, and I uh, want to learn more after uh, the WWDC week uh, to, to see the documentation, to see additional sessions. So I definitely didn't have uh, so much time during that week. Well, actually, let's talk about the notes you made then of the things that leapt out at you. Uh, I mean... Apple intelligence is the obvious big one. Um, Did you have any thoughts about how you could see that working with your apps? Uh, for sure. Uh, so uh, personally, for me, uh, this was uh, one single most important update that Apple released. Uh, frankly, we were expecting that Apple would announce something like that. So they, they have been uh, going to this for a while, like uh, with the Apple uh, M processors, uh, with additional uh, machine learning cores. Uh, uh, so uh, I was f- frankly expecting that would uh, they would provide something uh, locally on the machine uh, for, for large language models or some additional intelligence and this is the, 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 the most interesting part I think that uh, we are really as a, uh, as a technology uh, going through a new uh, industrial revolution which is AI revolution and uh, I believe Apple is one of the key players in this revolution because even though they might seem uh, very slow uh, adopting these technologies uh, but in the same time, they are uh, like very fundamental and uh, uh, approaching it uh, like an 
ecosystem that others could build upon. Uh, so uh, they would provide tools uh, for uh, like local machine learning uh, uh, models powered by Apple Silicon, uh, which other developers can, can build into their products and uh, benefit from that. So I think this is like one of the greatest uh, announcements uh, that we have been all waiting for. There's been this odd sense that Apple has uh, fallen behind the industry in AI, but we know that it's been doing neural engines. We know it's had machine learning for a decade or more or things. Uh, Do you feel that perception is right, that Apple is trying to catch up or are we all wrong about it? Uh, well, I think that they are uh, the company that they are planning uh, their releases years ahead. Uh, so they were preparing uh, the uh, hardware first, then they, they were preparing like some basic technologies, uh, like for example, uh, machine learning tools uh, in their uh, APIs. And right now they are releasing something on top of that, uh, which is very logical and will be uh, much uh, in, much better integrated into the ecosystem than any other players. You said, though, that you were expecting this. Uh, I mean, I know we all were. Um, were you, was there anything in the way Apple has done this that surprised you? Uh, well, definitely uh, they made a huge accent on the privacy uh, approach. Uh, I think uh, uh, being able to uh, use local uh, on the device uh, uh, language models uh, is a single most important thing to allow the uh, high volume adoption of these technologies because uh, not everyone, even frankly me, uh, uh, like to send our private information to OpenAI, for example, ChatGPT, in order to get some answer. I still consider that they can learn something from it, and sometimes it will pop up in some places you you wouldn't expect. Uh, So I think the the privacy approach that Apple introduced is the right way to go for the uh, all of this. artificial intelligence uh, uh, thing uh, so uh, it's it's a big uh, big update i think mm. there is an argument that apple is actually playing it safe and that therefore uh its ai features won't be that good won't be that interesting um do you subscribe i take you don't sound like you subscribe to that you think they're doing the right they've taken the right approach uh, well, uh, I think uh, when Apple introducing some new technology or tool or app, uh, they usually do it for the very mass market uh, because they have a like, large, large uh, audience. And it has to be appealing for, for this audience. Uh, but if you want to specialize, uh, if you want to make it better, to make more variations of it, to have some customizations, uh, users will already know how it works and, for example, what other limitations and then uh, extend to some other tools to get better experience and this is uh, what's good about apple because they could introduce uh, this uh, new ai technologies to such a wide audience and uh, that they will start using it and that they will build expectations uh, from other uh, ai providers as well interesting um it feels like um for us as users that all of this is coming and it's months away. For developers, normally, by this stage, you have at least a mostly complete uh, developer beta of things. And in this case, all the betas are out, but none of them have any Apple intelligence features in it. So is it actually quite a frustrating time for you waiting to get your hands on these kind of things? Uh, yeah, so they do have some uh, limited access to it, yeah, but most of them will, I think they will be uh, available later this year. Uh, but this is not the first time <laughs> they, they are doing this. Uh, so, yeah, it's a, a bit, uh, uh, you are excited to put your hands on these new technologies, but yeah, you still have to wait. But yet you can play already with some new uh, APIs that aid it and try to integrate them into your products uh, to see how they might work for you. Um, Another developer was telling me, I think it was actually last year, just 
not like this, just a conversation, that um, every single year they try to clear the decks for WWDC because they know it's either going to introduce amazing new things they want to add or it's going to break what they've got already and they're going to have to scrapple to fix it. Is that a typical developer worry at this time? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, usually it is very um, uh, yeah. Exciting moment to, to see the announcements. Uh, sometimes uh, Apple would share like, some of the apps or technologies. Sometimes they would kill some apps, like uh, this year they did uh, with calculators for iPad, for mm. example. Yes. <laughs> and uh, they also introduced the password manager, which is uh, you know, potentially could replace one password, for, for example, for some basic users. Definitely not uh, Teams and, and cor- corporate users. But still, like they are uh, adding some things that are logical to, to their operating system, to the way where they are going. And uh, this is sometimes could be a bad news for, for many developers. But yeah, uh, like for us, for example, uh, uh, the WWDC event usually is a very motivating thing, inspiring thing, uh, because uh, our team could uh, energize and receive this energy for at least half of the year. <laughs> and we know, okay, uh, what uh, we should adopt, what technologies we should adopt in our products, uh, what uh, exciting updates there will be in, in operating systems, what developer tools they added. And this is like a really exciting moment for the innovations. I think of it every time WWDC comes around. I think of uh, the features that I'm interested in that I'll use and all that. And I can imagine because I I kind I have developed in the past. I can see that I would just enjoy playing with the new things to see what I could come up with. But it also seems to me like it's quite a business job here because I imagine you want to have all the new features available when iOS 18 is publicly released but we don't really know when that is so I mean we know roughly but you so you're shooting for a certain target and you have you've got to decide what you want you've got to implement it for it is it quite a logistical problem for you sorting out this time of year uh, well, uh, usually if you don't change anything, uh, your app will still continue to work. <laughs> uh, but of course, uh, you will lose some competitive advantage and you will lose um, some opportunity to be featured by Apple on the App Store. Uh, so it's a good motivation to start doing things uh, and uh, think uh, how uh, most effectively you can use all of the new announcements to introduce them into your products as well. Uh, so... Uh, I think it's it drives the innovation and it drives the need to change for the developers because, uh, for example, if you have a product that works, that brings you uh, new customers and revenue, uh, so for some developers, uh, it, it is okay and they can uh, relax and work on some other things. Uh, but, for example, when you have a, a external uh, factor like the new OS coming and you need to do some changes, updates, to make it feel fresh and uh, up to date uh, with a new operating system, you still have to spend your time to update the app. And this is good for users as well because they could receive a refreshed uh, version of your app with new features and, and some updates. And this is good for developers because uh, they won't turn their app into abandoned work. Hmm. I was thinking there, uh, particularly of you and your team, but of course, like I said at the start, you are working with well over 200 other apps and developers. Um, Every developer is going through the same thing. I presume they're all racing to get the new features in and out. Um, Is that a problem for you or is it just the new version turns out? Do you have to manage 200 odd developers? Uh, yes, yeah, so of course they they are uh, developing their apps on their own, so we don't have to push them to to make some updates, uh, but we still uh, motivate them to have their apps updated, uh, because usually uh, it uh, returns to them through uh, user uh, engagement. Uh, so the the fresher the app, the the better the usage, and it means in our case uh, the better the revenue for for the vendors because we are paying based on the active usage of the apps and this is the way they can be uh, successful on our platform makes sense um you did mention sherlocking earlier um 
and actually specifically calculators. It seems to me that things like the, the one people think of straight away, the one I thought of straight away was PCALC, which is on every device ever made. And I love PCALC. And uh, I've tried the new calculator and it's very nice on the iPad, but it isn't PCALC. I'm sticking with what I've got. There are, like you said, they're going to be basic users who go away. You do have one app, particular app in a uh, setup that I was concerned about. You have Solver in there. Um, is Are you expecting them to try something new? Have you been able to speak to them about how they feel of Apple's new moves? Uh, so, uh, frankly, I didn't have an opportunity to speak to them yet, uh, but uh, I guess there would be some apps that will not be as uh, uh, needed anymore on the platform uh, as before. So they would have to innovate or to do something to to be to stay appealing to to their customers. And usually, this could be either uh, the user interface or some additional. F- feature set and that they are building in order to keep the audience in, engaged. So there are ways for opportunity and you still, you still have to think about how to make your app better uh, and more appealing to your customers than the default, default ones on Apple Pro platform. Something we've been discussing on the, the Apple side of podcast is uh, Apple makes very good apps, but they are very good up to a certain point. They, they don't tend to be powerful apps and things. So uh, Reminders, for example, is excellent, but it's never going to be OmniFocus or Todoist Pro or Things 3. Um, do you find that maybe uh, when Apple enters an area, they start making that division that there's a, a basic or a casual user, but the power ones gravitate to a, um, apps like Solver, like anything else you have on setup? Uh, I think, yeah, this is the case because they introduce something to users and at the same time uh, they have uh, the huge ecosystem of apps and other developers who can do certain things for certain audience much way better than Apple does. It, uh, either this could be like some specific users or some localized users, for example, in some countries, or this could be like corporate users so that needs uh, team access to some, certain things. Mm. Uh, so, but anyway, uh, they are providing, uh, besides these apps, they are providing uh, the whole ecosystem and developer tools that you can build and make your apps even better better than Apple's uh, uh, basic ones. Sure, yeah, it's realized, uh, I, I don't think I use setup enough. I worked it out not very long ago. Um, I'm, I think I probably use 15 apps out of setup's massive list. Um, nice. <laughs> I, I mean, I really like them. And I'm very glad and it's more than worth it for me. But I keep thinking I should really explore the rest. Um, are you, do you use all 200 apps? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, d- definitely not. <laughs> uh, I also have my own uh, workflow uh, of the apps uh, I use. Uh, so I think on average, uh, people on setup use uh, around uh, like seven to to twelve apps. Oh, right. uh, so and this is what uh, enables our business model. So um, if we split uh, the revenue of each user across seven apps, for example, it will be enough for every developer to be successful on, on the platform. I really thought I was uh, not using it enough, but I'm above average. I quite like that. Yeah, there there are some power users uh, that uh, has uh, like way higher uh, users than uh, than average, uh, but this is like a certain percent only of the audience. No, not not every uh, user is like this. Um, do you think that's going to change? Uh, there's the thing with the the EU, you're doing your own app store um, for it. That That's going to bring in all sorts of iOS apps and things. I mean, that sounds like a massive undertaking for it. Um, well, firstly, how is that going? Are, are you all done and ready for the EU? 
Yeah, so uh, technically uh, we're already uh, out. Uh, so we have a private batter that is currently running. Uh, so we want to collect as much feedback on this stage from our customers and vendors to know uh, what things to improve for us and what feedback we could provide to Apple. And uh, saying about Apple, they have been very helpful uh, to make this thing happen. Uh, so they provided uh, so many things that we thought that would have to build on our own uh, so we are uh, frankly thankful uh, to them because for example you know, they provided the whole infrastructure to uh, uh, distribute uh, apps uh, so it's not our part of the job it's uh, apple does it for us uh, they also uh, check for a different security uh, integrity they check for any malicious behavior of the apps so they still have a large part of the review process on their side and frankly we are again grateful to them for this because uh, over the last uh, I know, 17 years or how, how, how long has been how old is this uh, App Store okay not 17 uh, 15 years so yes <laughs> yeah. quite a while now <laughs> 15 years so over these 15 years they built a lot of internal tools to validate the apps to check if they are doing something unintentionally and it would be rather expensive and uh, challenging job to do it on our own. So this is a good part. The bad, the bad part, we're still not very happy with the, with the user experience of, uh, of getting the third-party marketplace on the iPhone at the first place uh, mm. because uh, there, there has been too many steps, too many... Uh, screens that users have to go through in order to get this working on their devices. So this at the moment could be a limiting factor uh, but uh, I hope uh, together with Apple and the EU re regulators will be able to, to solve this and make it much uh, easier uh, for customers to, to get it on board. Makes sense. This feels like uh, like I say it's a big job but you also at the same time as big changes coming. I mean I can't I presume there's no Apple intelligence benefit coming along to the EU, uh, the, market, the app store for it. Are there new tools that you think will, will improve the user experience over time? Uh, why do you think there is no Apple intelligence in the EU? Uh, I no, no, I, I mean in the sense of uh, providing an app store. Is there any artificial intelligence, Apple intelligence feature that an app store can offer? Something with... Um, I don't know, is there likely to be a way to better recommend certain apps? Um, is it a tool that has any connection with what you're having to achieve with an app store? Uh, well, uh, I think that they will be integrating Siri uh, with additional app intents or uh, metadata with the App Store. Uh, so potentially Siri, Siri could better understand your request and provide uh, and suggest apps for you. Uh, but uh, this is something we uh, we already do in setup. So we have uh, like intelligent uh, AI assistant uh, that could help you or provide you uh, with an app for any request, and this is uh, what already works for us. Uh, but what we would really uh, be uh, thrilled to see in the future is uh, the setup uh, uh, IE assistant integration with, uh, for example, app intents uh, that uh, could potentially provide users on our uh, platform with immediate solutions for, the, for their requests, even though the setup app may not be installed yet. So this could be a really interesting development for us, and we will be looking how we can use this uh, to make uh, access uh, to apps functionality easier in the future. Uh, you're mentioning how long the App Store's been around and said at the top that you've been running Mapple since I think it was 2008. Um, I've got to ask, where does the name come from, Nagpur? <sighs> Uh, yeah, so it was a long, long time ago. Uh, so 
frankly, uh, we were looking for available domain name, <laughs> and we we wanted to have some association with uh, Apple ecosystem because uh, we we wanted our apps and uh, company name to be findable for uh, uh, Apple in Apple ecosystem. So usually, long time ago, when you were looking for an app, you would usually add like uh, some app name or uh, what what it does for Mac. <laughs> so uh, it was a logical thing to add uh, uh, something like this in the name. It was challenging because, for example, for MacPo, it was very challenging to get a trademark, uh, but, but but we got it. Uh, for Klima Mac, we still don't have a trademark even after uh, 15, 16 years on the market. Bizarre, isn't it? The trademarking system, I do not understand it at all. But I get the why Mac, but poor, P-A-W, as, as in a cat kind of poor. What does it mean? It stands for something. Uh, yeah, so a long time ago, the operating systems were named after different uh, cats, uh, yes. like lion, mountain lion, <laughs> panther, etc. Uh, so well, this uh, was like logical uh, addition to it. That makes sense. Oh, I love that. I love as well that there is a name like setup. I mean, you know, it means a set of apps, but you don't think of that. If that's its name, and MacPaw is is a name. It's like you don't think of <laughs> and where that came from it just it is it's like um ebay uh they didn't want to call it that but they settled on some sort of portmanteau thing and now it's the perfect name so if you created something that's um risen above its origins and become your identity your brand i love that but yeah as i understand it as well as developing setup and all of this stuff, you also have a rather spectacular collection of Apple devices about Paul. Have I got that right or am I totally wrong? Uh, yes, you are correct. Uh, we uh, basically have every uh, Apple device uh, ever developed, except the Apple uh, the first the first Apple one. Uh, oh, right. I've been trying to, to get to get that yes. uh, on the auctions, but the the price uh, went too high, like seven thousand uh, dollars per for this device, and there is like only seven hundred, I think, of them in in existence. So it's uh, quite rare, rare beast. <laughs> See, the thing is, you say that. Uh, I- you run a hugely successful company. It's very big. And I can see even if you had no interest in software at all, you could be interested in the business and it could be your passion. But you say something like that about the collection. And I think you really are a Mac guy here. You are an Apple guy at heart, aren't you? Uh, yes, uh, I am. Uh, well, uh, basically because it is my passion, uh, I uh, I think that my career, my uh, life journey is very well connected to Apple because uh, when I was a student, I was once uh, introduced to Apple and I stayed with Apple after that uh, for my lifetime. Uh, so I think this company, the philosophy, the Steve Jobs example, uh, it really affects affected my way of life, my business decisions and, and the company. So I'm very grateful to Apple for, for being here for, for the humanity. <laughs> nice, nice word. But you said there's Steve Jobs uh, as an inspiration for it. What are the kind of things that you feel he brought you and us through Apple? What's helped you in that way? Well, the, the the main thing I think is the approach uh, to how they build how they build products. Uh, uh, and he's thinking about the design of the products. Uh, it's not only the way it looks; it, it must look great, but only uh, uh, the way, but also the way how they work. So it really uh, goes together the UI and the UX, and. Uh, it's not only about the software, but it's the whole user experience from, I don't know, first opening the, the, the Mac when they bought it to, uh, installing, uninstalling some apps and uh, using the whole ecosystem. So 
it's really amazing and i think many companies uh, can learn from that how to make their products better uh, because unfortunately over time uh, some profits becomes the priority or some rapid uh, uh, product changes become the priority and they are forgetting the, about the user experience uh, which is very sad well, listen, I mean, I could ask you questions about that. I could ask you questions about everything all day. But I need to remember as well, you are a developer, so you have to go to do some developing. And you've only just got back, haven't you, from Apple Park. So thank you very much after a very long flight for coming on the Apple Insider podcast. Deeply grateful for having you on here. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. Remember, this even more on Monday with HomeKit Insider, which will be looking at all the, you know, the home announcements from WWC. And then Wes and I will be back next Friday, by which time yeah, we'll have nothing left to talk about at all. I think we'll find something. Thank you very much for listening. Speak to you next time.